Okay, we're we're basically going to power on through. There's not a uh, there's not a coffee break, but while Wendell sets up, feel free to take a you know take a minute or so to stretch in place. Um, as a little mini break, we figure if people st start leaving this place, we'll never get them back in. So stick around. We're starting in one minute. Okay. Um, are you? Uh, I'm all set, but we need the. Uh, oh. Has the dondo disappeared on us? There was a dondo. Ah, there it is. Good. Okay. Okay, well, so now we're, is this working? It's not really working. What does in fact work? Is this, this is working okay? Okay, so now we're getting to um, the fourth and fifth talks in, our, in this session are both going to be by philosophers reflecting on these issues. Wendell Wollock has been a really a pioneer in thinking about ethical issues about artificial intelligence. Um, he's written a couple of classic books in the area. Uh, Moral Machines is, is really, I think, become the classic book on machine ethics, the project of trying to program or build ethical principles and ethical behaviors into machines. Uh, more recently, he's also written a book called The Dangerous Master on the way in which tech, we can keep te technology beneficial and under our control. He's based at the... Uh, Yale University and Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics, where he's been centrally involved with many projects in the foundations of technology and especially artificial intelligence. He's heading up a number of programs in that area now, and uh, today he's going to talk to us about moral machines from machine ethics to value alignment. So please welcome Wendell Wallach. Thank you. Am I close enough? Great. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, as those of you who know my work know um, I focus primarily on nearer term rather than the longer term uh, ethical and governance challenges posed by emerging technologies. As far as the longer term concerns such as superintelligence, I'm your friendly skeptic. I'm friendly to the can-do engineering spirit that says remarkable things are coming in, in the future. I'm skeptical as to whether we know enough about intelligence to know whether it's reproducible by computational means. And while my skepticism hasn't totally disappeared, I am truly heartened and appreciate the work being done by people like Stewart and Eliezer focusing on the control problem, reorienting the trajectory of artificial intelligence so that we can be working on both 
the long-term concerns, but through approaches that are actually going to help us deal with the near-term ethical considerations also. But I do sometimes become concerned that we are overlooking the socio-technological challenges that are arising. These are not just autonomous systems that we're building, but they're part of the whole human project. They're part of our socio-technological world. Uh, I sometimes think we overlook the extent to which what we're creating may really differ from anything we have seen beforehand. So perhaps the machine-human comparisons aren't as good as we'd like them to be. Um, in fact, we may be engaging in our own form of self-deception, and it might be helpful if we came up with a totally new ontological category for what we're creating here. Most of what, we'll, what we see tends to be joint cognitive systems rather than purely autonomous systems. And one of the major concerns that comes up when you're talking about joint cognitive systems is this problem of coordination and coordination failures. And coordination failures can lead to disasters. And disasters have a lot to do with helping shape the trajectory of how technologies uh, um, get, get, uh, get developed. For example, we have no idea what the public acceptance or how the public is going to react when we have the first self-driving car that kills a pedestrian. Think of this, for example. We're really engaged in an experiment with self-driving cars. And pedestrians are human subjects in these experiments, but they aren't giving any kind of con informed consent. And there may be a strong reaction. There may be a mild reaction. It's not clear at the moment. But there are other things that are going to affect the way in which this technology develops. If we don't get a ban on lethal autonomous weapons, then all bets are off as far as our ability to develop AI in a truly beneficial, robust, safe, and controllable manner. And then there's technological unemployment. That was John Maynard Keynes' term for the 200-year-old Luddite concern that each new technology will rob more jobs than it creates. Hasn't happened for 200 years. Each new technology creates more jobs, but perhaps we're starting to witness for the first time the downward pressure that automation is placing on jobs and wage growth. This is not an AI problem per se, but if our socio-political systems don't address this, then we may get reactions against the technology which won't stop development but could radically slow development or what will be acceptable and what won't be acceptable. But I want to focus upon the prospects for implementing moral decision-making faculties in computers and robots. That was a, a dream that first appeared to, uh, to science fiction writers, most notably Isaac Asimov, who with his stories on, on the laws for robots, the first one of which was roundabout in 1942, he changed the whole trajectory of robot fiction. Up to that time, we had only robots that turned bad. Suddenly, we had robots that could be good. Over, over the first decade of this 21st century, this idea, not the laws of robots per se, but the question of whether we could implement moral decision-making faculties in computers and robots, it captured an array of different scholars, philosophers, legal theorists, there were a few computer scientists in there, game theorists, psychologists, and they slowly gave birth to a new field of research now, when Colin and Alan and I set out to first map and lay foundations for that new field of inquiry, which, it, um, which we covered in our book, Moral Machine Teaching Robots Right from Wrong, it had many different names. From the more philosophical side, it was called machine morality, machine ethics, computational ethics, artificial morality. And then we had Eliezer and his colleagues who were uh, tackling it more directly from specifically whether we could control superintelligence, which was a, which was a different orient somewhat different orientation at that time. But the field didn't settle on one term per se. But I think the basic idea is that if we can design AI systems that are sensitive to moral considerations and factor those considerations into their choices and actions, new markets for their adoption will be opened up. On the other hand, if we fail to adequately accommodate human laws and values, there's going to be demands for regulations that limit their use. Initially, this field of research was one part moral philosophy, one part applied ethics, one part moral psychology, and another part, I would say, computer science, mathematics, um, more hard sciences 
would get involved. In other words, the hard sciences played a very small role in the research that was actually going on. But if you approach this from the perspective of a moral philosopher, and, uh, of, and it's been interesting that in our talk so far, words like morality and ethics have not appeared very often. In fact, the, I only counted it twice from, from, uh, from Max, and he used the term um, grammar school morality. Was that, was that the phrase that we had? I didn't, I didn't hear those words from either Stuart or, or Eliezer. But uh, when you approach it from the perspective of a moral philosopher, the question is, well, what role should ethical theory, should moral philosophy play in the design architecture and the control architecture of, of a computational system. And you might turn to two broad approaches. One is the top-down approach. And top-down approach, there is a philosophical definition at the top for those of you who like that kind of thing. But top-down really refers to capturing any moral theory or principle within the system. So we're talking about the Ten Commandments, we're talking about Kant's categorical imperative, utilitarianism, and Isaac Asimov's laws for robots, which started out as three but eventually became four. So it's really, could one of the languages of ethics be instantiated computationally? Bottom-up approaches refer much more to what happens in the moral development, the moral education of a child. Could you take it through a process where it learned about morality, regardless of whether it, it was directed toward any higher order ethical theory? And it takes inspiration from learning, from evolutionary psychology. Um, we have uh, game theory comes into play there, uh, genetic algorithms, all kinds of different techniques, learning algorithms might be appropriated for a learning computer. But there was a third area that came up when we looked at this, and, and, and much of the research that's gone on has looked at different approaches and whether they really are computationally tractable or not. Or not. But there's a third distinction that really has to be made here, and that's that humans are evolved systems. We evolved from a biochemical platform, and our higher order faculties, they emerged from the instinctual emotional brain. Computers are logical platforms from the get-go. Now, this might give computers certain advantages. They're natural-born stoics. They can do broad ranges of calculation. We humans, are, our rationality is bounded. Furthermore, these computers have an absence of emotional biases. They have an absence of base motivations, and they, have, and they are not likely to have emotional hijackings. On the other hand, I grew up in the age when stoicism was what was valued in moral decision making. We now live in the age of moral intelligence where we really reflect on both the beneficial and dysfunctional aspects of, of emotions. And that raises the question of whether artificial moral agents are gonna require some form of inte affective intelligence. Well, they need emotions of their own, and will it be a satisfactory if they just have cognitive emotions, weights that are programmed into them, or will they have, have somatic emotions? Will they have to be able to feel? And what if they have just simple faculties, such as the ability to read the emotional expressions on human beings? Are we gonna feel comfortable with that? I don't mind if a robot knows that I'm smiling, but I don't know what the goals of the robot may be, and I may be very uncomfortable if it knows when I'm vulnerable. But I think one of the most important areas in all of this, and perhaps where we made a significant contribution, which may not be as apparent today as it was back in 2008 when our book was published, is that there are many capabilities beyond moral reasoning that go into moral decision making. And that was a period when there was getting to be a lot of fresh research just beginning in different areas of, of human moral psychology. And people were beginning to focus on emotions, sociability, embodiment, theory of mind, empathy, consciousness, understanding, what these different capabilities play in our, in our decision making, capabilities other than emotion which were often overlooked in the history of, of moral philosophy. And that created a whole subfield of looking at specific capabilities, when they would be needed for moral decision making, and what role they played. Certainly they played 
roles of access to new forms of information that might not be there otherwise. But what role does consciousness, what functional role does consciousness play in moral decision making? And there is a paper that we produced on that particular question. But when you look at this whole challenge more broadly, there are two really hard problems here. One is whatever goal, norm, rules, principles, or procedures you select, how do you implement them? The other is what I refer to as framing problems. And framing problems is how does the system recognize it's in an ethically significant situation? How does it discern essential from inessential information? How does it estimate the sufficiency of the information it has? And I won't go through all of these, but these are you know, different kinds of things that are framing problems that are very difficult to bring in. So that gives you a, a very quick synopsis of what went on in the first decade. And I heard about values alignment for the first time in a speech that Stuart gave two years ago. And I immediately recognized it as a bottom-up approach to machine ethics. But it was clear that the engineers and the ethicists didn't necessarily know <laughs> that background or that thinking at all. And what was exciting for me is that this was starting to be picked up more as an engineering, as a computer science, as an AI challenge, and wasn't just the reflections of, of us philosophers and cognitive scientists and so forth. Um, looking at, at what the challenges might be. But it was interesting that the emphasis was on the word values here, and I came to understand that engineers were very uncomfortable with words like ethics, and I think that was actually illustrated in some of our earlier, earlier talks. They perhaps see morality as nothing more than politics by other means, or perhaps they're very cognizant of the failure of ethics or the constant ethical debates about which ethical theory, consequentialism or deontology or virtue theory should be superior and which form of those should be superior. The problem is that ethical theories didn't, have not led to clear action procedures, either for humans or for, or for computational systems. There's no moral algorithms. And I, but I also think that what's going on here is something similar to what happened at the beginning of the Enlightenment. At the beginning of the Enlightenment, we all acquired a self for the first time. Up to that time, individuals had souls. They didn't have selves. And the word self slowly came into being to substitute for the word soul as the individual because it didn't carry the theological baggage that the word soul did. So perhaps we're trying to expunge ourselves of some of the the, the dross that maybe ethics brings with it. But I'm concerned about whether we are bringing in new biases and that they'll have their own, their own losses. So I'm particularly concerned about what might be lost as we take on a broader and broader technocratic explanations for human faculties. I, for example, have meditated for 47 years now. I've got tens of thousands of hours in, in doing that. Now, perhaps I'm just stupid and I've wasted a significant portion of my life. I don't think so. I think what that is all about is about subtle sensibilities that science doesn't really know how to approach yet. Here's a quote I sort of like from Stephen Hawking. He said, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. Now, when engineers approach the challenge of implementing moral decision-making faculties, they usually think of ethics in terms of a utility function. I think we saw that um, quite effectively with Eliezer's conversation. Or they look at it in terms of constraints on behavior. And this is all, this is all very helpful and good, but I think we need to be aware what the problematics are there. For example, and this goes back into all kinds of reflections around utilitarianism, consequentialism, what is being maximized? What does that utility function really stand for? What are you trying to maximize? Is it pleasure, as was brought up in our last talk? Is it the good? And what is the good? Is it human welfare? And how do we define human welfare? Now, the previous century was beset by political systems for whom the greatest good for the greatest number was an aphorism that they lived by. And they had no compunction about killing tens and even hundreds of thousands of people in, the, in pursuit of maximizing the greatest good for the greatest number. This has always been a weakness of utilitarian approaches 
to, to ethics. And it is perhaps not an, an accident that John Stuart Mill, really one of the two founding fathers, along with Jeremy Bentham, of what we know as utilitarian theory, also wrote a book called On Liberty, which in some senses compensates for, I think, the weaknesses within utilitarianism by itself. So the importance is that utilitarianism, if left just to itself, can run roughshod over human rights. And human rights are essentially deontological. But nevertheless, utilitarianism is very attractive from a scientific perspective because it says just calculate. Look at the various consequences of your action and add up the benefits and, and um, losses that you get and then select the one that gives you the most, the most benefits. The problem is our information tends to be inadequate, tends to be inaccurate, and consequences can't fully be determined. So very few people actually go through some form of utilitarian process, utilitarian analysis, though there are strong advocates for that, and I even advocate for that in, various con in certain contexts. So uh, here's two of our main advocates. Um, we have Peter Singer and we have uh, uh, Josh Green. Now let me take you back to something that came up yesterday a little bit to talk about another problematic with utilitarian determinations of the appropriate action, and that's the application of trolley car problems to the driverless cars. So I think we all know what that's about. That's largely about should the car kill a number of, of pedestrians or individuals in some form or another, should it drive off the bridge and kill the passengers of the car. And uh, in Science Magazine, there were two articles about this in June. One of those articles um, was a piece of, of uh, public opinion research that found that the preponderance of people wanted a utilitarian calculation. They said, kill the, kill the least number of people. But they were asked another question. And surprise, surprise, most of them said, I would not buy a car <laughs> that would kill me and my family. Now, there was a companion piece to that by Josh Green. And Josh Green said, well, let's build moral algorithms into these cars. Now, he could be excused for such naivete because he'd read Moral Machines. In fact, he'd read it <laughs> twice. <laughs> and even though I have advocated for the implementation of moral decision-making faculties in computers and robots, this is not a morally decidable challenge. There is no right answer. Are we going to, for example, implement moral algorithms into cars that might kill the occupants, but it stops millions of people from buying those cars, which means to stop one once in a trillion accident and save a couple lives, we may lose thousands of people who die because, they, because of human error. In other words, we've got a long-term utilitarian calculation and a short-term utilitarian calculation. It's not decided by moral theory. It's the, the need for the establishment of a new norm, and we probably need multi-stakeholder uh, committees to engage in that process. Now, there's also been a lot of discussion that's gone on over the last few hundred years about whether uh, you can turn utility, utility into rules and duties, or rules and duties into utility. In other words, can most of our rules and utility, or at least the ones we want to carry into the future, can they be described in utilitarian terms? And from the deontological side, um, it's often been said, well, the greatest good for the greatest number is one of the prima facie duties that we have but it is not the determinant of all actions. It just plays off against other prima facie duties that we have. From the side of utilitarianism, there's been concern about how we can contract this whole process because utility analysis can be really time consuming, can take a lot of energy, and can we contract it down to simple heuristics? So can we have rule utilitarianism, which is in a sense a compromise where you turn your utility analysis into a bunch of, of rules, heuristics that you can make quick decisions. But all of us understand there are some limitations of where making quick decisions are good and where they override other concerns. 
And as we have become aware, there are cognitive biases. There are all kinds of cognitive biases that we humans indulge. And we are subservient to bad reasoning in, um, in areas that Dan Kahneman has, uh, has helped elucidate for us all. And I guess all I want to say is sort of bringing up my concluding section is that we need to start thinking about what are the cognitive biases of engineers and the ways they're going to approach this challenge. And I am not bringing this, these critiques up as a naysayer. I am totally supportive of any approach to implement moral decision-making faculties in our computers and robots to see how far we can get. But the biases are that ethics is merely a constraint problem, and it's not merely a constraint problem. Or that utilitarianism or consequentialism is the way we should go in all matters. No, it's the correct way of going in some matters, but there are areas of concern, such as medical ethics, where it becomes problematic. And that the stoicism is a good thing that robots have. I think a lot of people understand, no, the stoicism may not be adequate for some of the kinds of moral intelligence we like. And there's a tendency to confuse right and wrong with human moral psychology. In other words, the way we make dis moral decisions isn't, also has flaws within it, also has cognitive biases within it. And there'll be a tendency to ride roughshod over the is-ought distinction, as Eliezer did when he brought up David Hume in, in, in his talk, or the naturalistic fallacy. I'm not gonna get into those at all because that's way beyond the scope of, of this particular talk. But all I'm trying to say is, let's keep the biases in mind. We are still engaged in an experiment here. We're engaged in an inquiry as to how far we can get in creating intelligent systems through computational means. We have no idea. We have all kinds of theories and all kinds of conclusions about where this is going. No, this is still an experiment, and a lot of these theories may turn out to be wrong. And if, if there happen to be clear limits in our ability to develop artificial moral agents or manage robots, then it's incumbent upon us to recognize those limits so that we can turn our attention away from a false reliance on autonomous systems and toward more human intervention in the decision-making processes of computers and robots. Thank you very much. Hi, Henry Kong here. Um, yeah, Stuart was talking about how uh, one approach to making machines ethical is to program them to be uh, sort of more like us or, or, or learn from how, how people are or how mm -hmm. people are. Um, but, uh, you know, I see a conflict here, uh, and you're saying another approach is to sort of um, teach them not how we are, but how we want to be uh, in terms of things like um, consequentialism, uh, deontology. But then, you know, I. Who's the ontology and who's consequentialism? I, I look around the room and I see a certain demographic, for example, you know, yeah. white, male, affluent, um, Western. And uh, if these are the people who are going to be creating these machines, then that creates biases of its own. And so, you know, you have people who, um, well, Jonathan Haidt calls them weird ethics. So are, are we going to program weird ethics into, into, the, uh, into, the, into the systems? So there's a conflict between do, the, do we want the machines to be more like us or more like the people we want to be, but then who are the people we want to be? So I don't think the problem here is that we know what the machine should be, but there is probably going to, we're probably going to create standards for them, and if they don't at least live up to good human values, we, uh, we're going to be very uncomfortable with them. I mean, it would be great if they could do what your children do. They bring you an ethical dilemma that, um, that you have no answer for. But you're just thrilled <laughs> that they recognize that that ethical dilemma even exists. Put there, Wendell. Oh, excuse me? Just lift your feet for a second. Okay, okay good. Um, but there's, there's a lot more to this, and uh, there's other approaches to, to this problem. Uh, there's a, the third big tent in ethical theory is virtue theory. And virtue theory says it's not the consequences of your action or follow the the good, which is a determinant of what's right, true, and just. But it says it's the actions of what virtuous people do, and it's about the cultivation of that kind of character. 
which, which would be great if we do within machines. We can start to think about it now that we have some more effective learning algorithms than we used to have. But that's kind of an interesting approach because these bottom-up approaches tend to be much more flexible, much more adaptive than the top-down, which you know, are very hard to fit in all actions within one category or not. So we're going to want this kind of adaptive learning that, that Stuart outlined, but we may also need to subject it to some kind of top-down evaluation as to what it's, whether it's appropriate or not. He alluded to the problems of whose behavior are they observing? Who are they learning from? Are we going to be able to keep them isolated from, from the bad actors? Could you imagine a robot that was just sitting there watching American news for the last six months trying to learn what appropriate values were <laughs> to be an American citizen. Okay. Next, uh, I see one at the, uh, at the back there. Just next to you. Hi, my name is Chris Hatter, uh, Columbia University alumnus. So my question is, in the present philosophy engineering dialectic that does exist in part in this room and in other spaces, what do you see as the big problems in addition to the ones you've already enumerated, which are the, the human biases? Well, the biggest problem is we all live in our silos. You know, and we have very little appreciation for the perspectives of other scholars. And, and my work right now, partially in thanks to uh, a grant that came from the Future of Life Institute, and the steward and I have been running some workshops around, has been focused more on silo busting bringing different kinds of thinkers together and brainstorming over these ideas and getting insights from each other. Um, it's not just that we live in silos, but our institutions don't reward people for transdisciplinary thinking. They all say we need more interdisciplinarians, but very few people get rewarded within the present structure of academia for, for interdisciplinary work, and it often happens only within, for, from older established scholars. It would be nice if the young scholars who want to jump into these more transdisciplinary challenges we would get rewarded for that, that we'd have more of these institutes that really want to draw upon a transdisciplinary perspective. Okay, one more quick question. Um, Rob, over there. Hi, uh, thanks for that. This is uh, mostly just a request for clarification. Mm -hmm. At one point, you distinguished between, I think you said, uh, merely cognitive emotions versus real affect. You were wondering wh which of those you might need for moral decision making. Can you just say a little bit more about uh, what you mean by uh, each of those notions? Sure. Well, all of the super rational faculties or faculties beyond reasoning that I had on that slide, there are attempts to simulate them, at least in in cognitive in uh, computer science in one form or another. So we have affective computing, we have machine consciousness, we have all these fields going on. But when people talk about affective computing, they're often talking about putting weights on the relationship between different percepts. So if it comes to killing somebody, maybe you could put a heavy weight that says no. <laughs> You know, so it's really a mathemat. Ultimately, it's a mathematical weight on a judgment that represents an emotion, and that's what I mean by cognitive emotions versus somatic emotions, which are what we feel. Now, there is a view of life that not only consciousness but all of what we are is this vast infrastructure of somatic emotions of somatic markers, and that a lot of what our moral education is about is strengthening and weakening those markers. And furthermore, that our emotions are very much about maintaining us as integrated beings, as integrated entities. And that that is a fundamental grounding for our ethics. That's way beyond the scope of anything that we're talking about in AI at this point. And, and, it, and that is perhaps beyond what most of us want these machines to understand in terms of practical ethics and not doing harm in some of the obvious contexts that they, they will move through. But it may be something fundamentally that colors what it means to be an ethic, ethical agent, what it means to be an ethical being, why we evolved as ethical beings because we needed throughout evolution to maintain 
that integrity. And unfortunately, too often, we fall, fall to what I will call the, uh, the ethics heuristic, which is ethics is what is my opinion. And my opinion should be treated as a categorical imperative. <laughs> and if nothing else, I'm just trying to say to here, there's perhaps a little bit more going on in ethics and whether or not it's going to yield us algorithms, simple action procedures. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, the last talk in this session is by another philosopher. Steve Peterson is at uh, Niagara University in New York. Steve's background is in, uh, is in epistemology. He's worked in a whole lot of, er of, of fields over the years. He's done some really interesting work on algorithmic metaphysics and 